on many worlds across the galaxy, curious structures have been found carved of black-hued stone, the forgotten remnants of some long-dead race. This is hardly unusual, and they are noted without much excitement among countless other ruins left by countless other races. Occasionally, expeditions will be sent to learn their secrets, and hidden entrances uncovered to vast complexes located far beneath a planet's surface. Sometimes, these parties return with exotic trinkets or half-believed tales. Sometimes, they do not return at all. Few across the galaxy recognize these sites for what they truly are, and the threat they represent. Fewer still might know how it came to be that one of the first races to set forth blindly into a galaxy of darkness would be damned for eternity, transformed into a tortured race of soulless constructs known as the Necrons. Neither the gods nor galaxy were kind to the Necron tier. Millions of years before humanity evolved to sentience, in an ancient formation of stars on the outer edge of the galaxy, they raised their civilization under the torturous light of a blighted sun. Endlessly scoured by piercing solar winds and terrible radiation, the lives of the Necron tier were short and uncertain. Their bodies were consumed by agonizing cancers and constant illness. Their existence was defined by overwhelming loss and grief. Cities were built in honor of the dead and the living who wandered their streets relegated to brief caretakers of vast sepulchres and ornate tombs. Driven by the desperate hope that they might free themselves from the cruel maladies of their son, the Necron Tyr set out to carve an interstellar empire. Bereft of psychic powers, the Necron Tyr were unable to pierce the Immaterium, and instead relied upon slow-moving torch ships, carrying enormous stasis crypts. Though arduously slow to realize their dream, the Necron Tyr were able to colonize much of the galaxy. Tragically, however, they could not rid themselves of their physical frailty, for even on rich, unspoiled worlds, the curse of their homeworld left them withered and short-lived. It was a terrible irony then, that of the few other civilizations present in the galaxy, they should encounter the beings known as the Old Ones. Ancient even to the Necron tier, the Old Ones had long since conquered the burden of mortality and now were gifted with eternal life. Yet it was a gift they refused to share, and the entire Necron tier race was left to fester in jealousy and resentment. The unity that had propelled them into space was shattered, and competing Necron tier dynasties warred with one another in a conflict that threatened to destroy their entire race. Had these wars of succession been allowed to continue, the Necron tier might have been yet another footnote in galactic history, a civilization that rose, burned brightly and briefly, only to be extinguished. But the Triarch, the ruling council of three that governed the Necron tier race, realized that only an external enemy had the power to reunite the dynasties and revive the spirit of their civilization. The choice was obvious. Only the Old Ones presented a credible threat, and the jealousy and resentment of the Necron tier had been kindled into a burning rage. Successionist dynasties were offered amnesty, the Necron Tyr reunited under the rule of the Triarch, and armies and fleets were sent to fight a war they could not win. In contrast to the Necron Tyr, the Old Ones were the masters of the Immaterium. Through the use of warp gates and the extra-dimensional webway, they constantly outmaneuvered the plodding forces of the Necron Tyr. Despite their superior technology, they were little more than an irritation to the Old Ones, and faced with an invincible enemy, the dynasties fell back into civil war among themselves. Having only accelerated the complete collapse of their rule, the Triarch again searched for salvation. Competing accounts differ on how the Necron Tyr first encountered the Catan. Some claim they were discovered in the heart of a dying star, while others say that the burning hatred the Necron Tyr held for the Old Ones acted as a type of beacon. Regardless, the power of the Catan was incalculable. Beings of incredible, raw energy, the Catan dwarfed entire worlds, 
their consciousness too vast to even comprehend. That the Necrontier could even communicate with them was a miracle, and the oldest dynasties actively courted their favor. Through an eldritch type of living metal, the incorporeal forms of the Catan were gifted bodies to inhabit in the physical realm. Thus clad, their consciousness and power was focused, and they soon came to delight in the pleasures available within the material universe. One such Catan, acting as a forerunner to the coming of his brothers, appeared before the Triarch. It claimed it and its kind, like the Necrontier, had fought a war against the Old Ones, a war they had lost and now were hidden across the galaxy, eagerly awaiting allies who might help bring that ancient race to account. It promised the Necrontier everything they had wanted, unity, power, and most importantly, the secret of immortality. With the pact between the Necrontier and the Catan sealed, the Star Gods revealed the form that immortality would take. Enormous bio-furnaces were constructed and roared through the days and nights. What arcane procedures took place within are best forgotten. But while it was the people of the Necrontier race who entered them, it was something else entirely that emerged. In place of diseased and frail bodies came shells of living metal, and the awful truth of the pact made clear. Through their transformation, the Necrontier race had perished stripped not only of their flesh, but of their souls. Yet while the price had been steep, every promise made by the Catan was fulfilled. Clad in armor that only their most terrible injuries could destroy, the newly born Necron race and their Catan allies wrought a terrible vengeance upon the Old Ones. Even as their last strongholds were broken, and even as the webway was penetrated and invaded, the Triarch had realized the deception played upon their own people. Where they had once feasted on the energy of the stars, now the Catan feasted upon living souls. The Star Gods had gorged themselves on the Necrontier and brought to the galaxy a war of such horror that even the victors would find no triumph. In an act of perfectly calculated betrayal, the Necrons waited until the Old Ones had been wiped out and then turned on the Catan in their moment of victory. Weakened and arrogant as the result of their long struggle, the Catan were shattered by the unimaginable energies of the living universe, focused into weapons too mighty for even the Star Gods to endure. While the Catan were a part of a fundamental fabric of reality, and therefore impossible to destroy completely, their shattered forms were bound within thousands of smaller fragments, scattered across the galaxy, so they might never reform. The Catan had been shattered, but the time of the Necrons was over. The cost to their civilization had been immense, and powerful psychic entities, unleashed during the wars against the Old Ones, threatened to scour the galaxy. Younger races, created by the Old Ones to aid in their war, were also rising, with the wrath of the Eldari in particular impossible for Necrons to stand against. The Silent King, first among the Triarch, and the only member of that council who survived betraying the Catan, gave one final order. His people were commanded to sleep, to wait for a time in which even the great power of the Eldari had withered, and the Necrons might return to rule the galaxy. With this order fulfilled, the Silent King vanished, fleeing into the intergalactic void, seeking solace and penance for the terrible suffering he had inflicted upon his people. On countless worlds, the skeletal constructs of the Necrons lay dormant. They slumbered through the aeons as the galaxy healed from the wounds wrought during the war against the Old Ones, and new civilizations rose to fill the void left by their demise. But time wounded the Necrons in ways even their ancient enemies could not. Shifting tectonic plates crushed Necron strongholds on untold planets. Stars went supernova, consuming tomb worlds in their death throes. And everywhere, primitive races fought over the scraps of Necron territories. Even tomb worlds left untouched have felt the decay of time. 
Cascading failures in stasis crypts destroyed billions of dormant Necrons, while others have been affected by a slow madness that threatens to override their original programming. Even the last order of the Silent King has not been precisely followed. The great awakening of the Necron race has not occurred in unison, but in fitful starts across the millennia. Errors in circuits and protocols have enacted the revivification of tomb worlds far earlier than intended, with some said to have stirred in time to see the great crusade of the Emperor of Mankind, the Cataclysm of the Horus Heresy, or the Endless Wars of the Age of the Imperium. While many have risen, most lay dormant still. The first skeletal machines encountered by the younger races were misidentified either as mindless constructs, another trivial Xenos race on par with the Hrud or Krut, or most curiously, as chaos androids constructed by an extinct subspecies of abhumans. Of all the great powers in the galaxy, only the remnants of the Eldari understand the full nature of the Necron civilization. All Necrons, regardless of their rank or station, have had their flesh replaced with Necrodermis. This living metal possesses the extraordinary ability to regenerate damage nearly instantaneously, flowing back together as if a liquid to repair even the largest gashes or tears. Given enough time, even the most terribly damaged Necron constructs can be repaired, or its consciousness transferred to a new body. Only a select few Necron constructs, however, possess a consciousness in the way the Imperium or the other races of the galaxy might understand it. The transformation of the Necron tier race stripped the intellect, self-awareness, and personality from all but the most strong-willed. These individuals, often the leaders or elite of Necron tier society, were given the very finest Necrodermis bodies, but even they are pale shadows of their former selves. The professional soldiery were given comparatively crude bodies, while the common citizen received whatever remained. These tortured creatures are numb to all joy and experience, bound solely to the will of their masters, and requiring constant direction to fulfill their purpose. Even so, a tiny spark of their mortal selves remain, just enough to torment them with memories and echoes. During the time of the Necron Tier, their civilization embraced a rigid hierarchy. While split between various dynasties, all were ultimately subject to the will of the Triarchy, a council of three pharaons, the greatest and most powerful leaders of their race. The head of this council was known as the Silent King, for he never addressed his subjects directly, but rather through the pharaons who ruled alongside him. The short lifespan of the Necron Tier ensured that members from many dynasties were represented within the Triarch, or held the position of Silent King itself. Following their biotransference, the hierarchy of the Necron Tier became absolute with the Necrons. Completely subservient to the will of the Silent King, even the Pharaons were forced to follow his directives through command protocols embedded in every Necron mind. So ashamed by his failures, however, the last Silent King severed these protocols upon his withdrawal from the galaxy, and ultimate authority had been split across the various dynasties that remained. Pharaons and other ranks of Necron overlords have awoken to find themselves free of the Silent King and able to pursue their own agendas. Combined with aberrations in their programming that leave some overlord struck by madness, the actions of the Necron race are eclectic almost to the point of randomness. The Necron lords of some dynasties display a splendid adherence to honorable conduct, sending forth emissaries and diplomats. On the battlefield, they adhere to the spectacle of honorable war, rigorously applying their ancient codes of battle. Other dynasties have embraced treachery and terror, utilizing psychological warfare, deception, and assassination. More still focus their attention inwards, pursuing the systematic extermination of any life forms who interfere with their affairs. 
While these acts are extraordinarily diverse in their extent and method, all are directed towards a single common goal, the restoration of the Necron dynasties to rule over the galaxy. Yet with the Triarch long destroyed, most tomb worlds still dormant, and others inflicted with madness, there can be no grand strategy. Each tomb lord pursues whatever course he deems most suited to circumstance. Some have sought to dominate nearby threats and sow terror on alien worlds. Others have stockpiled raw materials, or prioritized the recovery of cultural treasures or artifacts. A few have even begun the search for organic species whose bodies might be suitable vessels to reverse the curse of biotransference and bring about the return of the mortal Necron Tear. When committed to battle, the Necrons typically strike with little warning. A Necron Lord will have a great variety of forces at his command, but will typically rely on soldiers known simply as warriors or immortals, which made up the ancient armies of the Necron Tear. Lichgard, Deathmarks, and Praetorians are used more sparingly, while the largest Necron constructs are reserved for wars of annihilation and vast interstellar campaigns. Their highly advanced technology means that their armies typically need only march forward, and an overwhelming, inexorable advance has become synonymous with the Necrons. Despite this, they are capable of more nuanced tactics when necessary, and there exist a variety of Necron constructs capable of infiltration or rapid maneuver. But the Necrons' greatest advantage in combat remains their near-indestructible Necrodermis bodies. In the rare instances in which their armies have been destroyed, or the tide of battle has turned against them, every Necron construct has simply disappeared from the battlefield, phase shifting to some other place or reality, so that they might repair their wounds only to re-emerge once more. The method by which the Necrons achieve this remains unknown. They likely retain some access to the webway, forcing their way into the ancient labyrinth through the use of eldritch portals known as Dolmen Gates. Necron starships have also been occasionally sighted, but never in great numbers. Whether the Necron fleet did not survive their long slumber intact, or they have the means to conceal their movements, likewise remains unknown. To the Imperium of Man and the other great powers of the galaxy, the Necrons remain a shrouded presence. Terrible when roused to battle, and cryptic in their actions, but hardly a major presence. With the fall of Cadia and the spread of the Great Rift across the galaxy, there are precious few resources to devote to the search of the rumored tomb worlds or the mysteries of some long dead race. But as the time of ending begins across the galaxy, it is becoming harder and harder to ignore that tomb worlds are beginning to awaken at an ever increasing rate. Certain patterns are starting to emerge, evidence that the power of the ancient Necron Empire is beyond even what the Eldari remember. As the great hive tendrils of the Tyranids sweep across the galaxy, it has been noted that even they avoid specific worlds. On Mars, an entire region has been quarantined, ostensibly due to some ancient contamination, but in truth, because a fearful entity dwells beneath it a so-called Dragon of Mars. And despite the rampant spread of the ruinous powers and other warp-spawned horrors, there are curious places in the galaxy where even the overwhelming howls of the warp have been silenced. Places where the silence is far worse than the screams. Some have even claimed that the stars themselves whisper of the Silent King, that its exile is over and it walks among the dynasties once more. If the Great Awakening is finally at hand, then the remnants of the Eldari, the vast host of the Imperium, the Orc Hordes and Tyranid Hive Mind, even the Gods of Chaos themselves, might finally learn that for all their fearsome power, this galaxy was never truly theirs. That they are merely trespassers, whose time is finally Oh. oh, wonderful. 
I was concerned I might have missed you. Please allow me to express my fulsome appreciation of your investigation, as you call it. Thoroughly researched, well-spoken, delightful from beginning to end. A few errors here and there, a few omissions. I had hoped that I or my collection might warrant inclusion. But you make cuts for time, I entirely understand. I am something of a seeker into mystery myself, and I feel a sense of professional courtesy to inform you that the presence of your institute has not gone unnoticed here. You are watched by some of whom you are already aware, and by others of which you are not. It is so rare to find those who might appreciate my work. It would be such a shame to see you become an agent of disorder. Until then, feel free to visit any time. There is always a place for you here. <laughs> this investigates the nations, factions, and organizations of alternate worlds. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to join the Templin Institute, consider pledging to our Patreon page. Along with increased security access, you'll be able to vote in polls to determine future topics, get custom wallpaper every week, and receive some other exclusive rewards. 